Well, welcome again, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, before we uh, get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree Nation, the Métis, the Diné, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota Nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Innu, and all of nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, where I am right now. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to Connie Sorio to, uh, to guide us into our workshop today. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Migrant Justice Workshops, Equal in Rights and Equal in Dignity. Um, for today, we will have with us uh, partners uh, from uh, the Maritimes, uh, uh, Anne, and um, from the Cooper Institute, and also Roland Moreno from the Filipino community of New Brunswick. Also with us is a Jasser, um, who's going to be speaking about, you know, her relation, his relationship with Kairos and uh, the Empowering the Temporary Foreign Workers uh, Project team members, Essel and David. I would like to start off with, you know, painting a global picture of migration. Um, we all know that forced migration or movement displacement of people from their home countries has become a very, you know, uh, worrisome phenomenon. Uh, in, nine, in, in 2000, for example, Hundred and uh, the, uh, the organization, the International Organization of Migration, has recorded 150 million international migrants, and this includes uh, international or foreign temporary workers who left their countries to seek, you know, better job opportunities in the countries where they come from. Moving forward, in 2020, there's about 281 million international migrants in the world today. And 164 million of that are international temporary foreign workers. People who had been, you know, um, forcibly displaced from their communities because of climate change, because of militarization, because of environmental destruction or mining activities in their communities and the lack of job opportunities and their home countries forced these migrants or migrant workers to leave home, be separated from uh, their families and sacrifice to work in countries where they are completely strangers to be able to provide support to uh, their families and extended families back home. In 2001, when Kairos, you know, started, we look at the international situation of migrants at the, at the global level. So our work uh, in, under the Asia Pacific uh, International Partnerships or Global Partnerships, we started supporting in Asia, the formation of migrant workers organizations in Hong Kong, 
in the Philippines, in Thailand, and in Indonesia, and other countries in the Asia Pacific uh, continent. We also supported the formation of global alliances of temporary foreign workers or migrant workers organizations. We supported the formation of International Migrants Alliance, the formation of Migrante International. We supported the, uh, the holding of International Assembly of Migrants and Refugees parallel to the Global Forum of Migration uh, um, um, summits in, in, in those, uh, yeah, uh, in the various years. So moving forward, I would like us to look at, you know, uh, what is happening in Canada? What is the situation of migrant workers in Canada? And how is Kairos, or how has Kairos responded, you know, uh, uh, in the last 20 years and moving forward, what are we doing to support the migrant workers in Canada? And also in relation to our overall advocacy for permanent status of migrant workers in Canada. So, so I would like us to welcome David and yeah, for, for this part of, you know, uh, the presentation or information sharing. Thank you, Connie. Um, so today I'm going to be taking a look back at Kairos's migrant justice actions over the years. Um, I did a lot of digging to find uh, quite a bit of information. Um, and I have a timeline that I'm going to be sharing in the chat uh, later on, but I'm going to be looking at two specific um, submissions. Um, but first, uh, in 1966, a worker representing 13 Jamaican laborers who were some of the first under the newly founded Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program asked his employer for a light bulb for their lodging. The employer had a friend over for a few drinks at the time, and the friend did not take kindly to this request, threatening to fight the worker. He returned to his lodging without the light bulb, and they all settled in for the evening. The employer's friend, however, being fully drunk and still fuming from having their evening interrupted, entered the workers' lodging and threatened them all with a shotgun. Thankfully, no one was harmed uh, or injured during this fracas. All 13 workers fled the farm, walking in the dark of night to another farm nearby where other Jamaicans were employed. Under the SOP program, 10, employee, or 10 of the workers were able to find jobs on other farms with three opting to return to Jamaica. The government paid back all of the expenses uh, that the farmer had put in to bring the workers over and faced no consequences for the threats to the workers. Through the 50 years of the SOP and temporary foreign worker programs, the number of migrant workers in Canada has expanded into the hundreds of thousands. They are an essential part of the agricultural and caregiving sectors, with many workers taking TFW and SOP jobs for decades. There are supportive employers utilizing these programs, but like in this example, migrant workers have experienced violations of human and labor rights in Canada since the beginning of these programs. Even as policy has shifted to ensure the safety and rights of workers, both, both programs prioritize the needs of employers, with benefits to migrant workers being an added plus. As we celebrate 20 years of Kairos, today I want to look at two key actions in Kairos's history, speaking out on uh, the equalities inherent in these programs. First, in 2006, Kairos, along with FCJ Refugee Senator Center, uh, the National Alliance of Philippine Women in Canada, and the United Food and Commercial Workers Canada, made a submission to the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Social Development, and the Status of Persons with Disabilities. Many of the recommendations from this submission are points that we're still, we are still arguing for. In particular, a transparent appeal process and dispute resolution mechanism, lifting restrictions on mobility of TFWs to allow for changing workplaces or living offsite, uh, bringing their immediate families as part of uh, coming to Canada, and of course, status for all upon arrival. The pessimist in me wants to see the continuing relevance of these proposals as a sign that there hasn't been much progress. But looking more realistically, change takes time. And with the government, change takes 
an immense amount of time. I see the continuing relevance of these issues as a sign that we are dedicating ourselves to critical and necessary change for migrant workers in Canada. Uh, also, there have been points um, where there have been steps forward, particularly in point eight shown here uh, about providing resources. Uh, there have been great strides in creating a network of support services for workers, uh, which has been supported by the government. And I'm sure we will hear much more about that as this presentation goes on. In 2016, Kairos put forward another submission to the Standing Committee on Human Resources, citing concerns with the direction of policy around migrant workers. The six, concern raised, six concerns raised in Cairo's submission indicated a necessary change in direction. Uh, as a result of pressure from Kairos and other groups, the standing committee ended the four year cap where you could work for four years uh, and then you would have to stay out of Canada for four years uh, and indicated that the government would work on eliminating the employer specific work permits. These were steps in the right direction, but the committee also recommended yet another review of pathways to permanent residency. Of the 21 recommendations of the government, uh, 13 applied to and benefited employers, and only two were favorable to migrant workers. Some recommendations seemed to benefit uh, workers, but sought to keep workers as permanently temporary. There was and still is a long way to go to fix these programs to prevent abuse and exploitation of workers. Status for all upon arrival remains a critical issue. We continue to advocate for workers having the freedom to change jobs, to access government supports, and the ability to bring their families to Canada. Since the beginning of the temporary foreign worker program, when a worker loses their job, either through their contract not being renewed or being fired, TFWs have little recourse available to them. Severely injured workers, workers who are not being paid appropriately or at all, or workers asking for simple amenities like a light bulb, uh, can be dismissed from farms and sent home, um, as the TFW program does not allow for movement between farms. There is the Open Work Permit for Vulnerable Workers program that acts as a temporary fix for this issue, but it's not guaranteed to all workers experiencing abuse. And we're having a webinar next week about this very topic. Um, so if you would like to know more. All that being said, I don't wanna end on a sour note. Uh, this 15 year period of Kairos' work in migrant justice saw passionate advocates like Connie, Alfredo, and many more bring the voices of migrant workers to the forefront. These are just two submissions in a long history of this work. Uh, the work that we are doing today is informed by the advocacy of this formative time. There were setbacks, change came slowly, but Kairos has been speaking truth to power for two decades now, and the momentum built from this period from 2001 to 2016 continues to grow and informs the strides we are making today. So that is what I had. Um, and stop sharing. Uh, we are going to move along to uh, Anne Wheatley from the Cooper Institute. So, hello. Hey, so thank you for that. Um, that was really interesting. Um, so Cooper Institute, which is in Prince Edward Island, has been engaged in migrant justice work since 2010. And since then, and I should say thanks to some wonderful project coordinators, started with, starting with Josie Baker, Paula Flores, now Eliza McLaughlin and Ryan McRae working on the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Project. Um, we forged connections with and supported migrant workers in accessing services and in advocating for their rights for over 10 years now. We've organized workshops, community events and activities, carried out, um, uh, different kinds of research, developed practical information resources, facilitated the development of a community-based action team for migrant workers' rights. At the same time, we've made connections with groups working across the country and um, at the national level, so including Migrant Rights Network, Canadian Council for Refugees, and of course, Kairos. Um, and that's really important. At the time in 2010, we weren't aware of anyone else doing this kind of work in the Maritimes, certainly not in Prince Edward Island. Um, migrant workers were essentially invisible here. Um, so our connection with Kairos and the other groups was really important. I think 
we first got involved, and I think it was through the local Kairos group, which really was Jim and Myrna Wicks, or led by Jim and Myrna. Um, they were the first to connect with us. And but very shortly after, um, it was Connie Sorio, of course, who came to, who had been coming to Prince Edward Island. I don't think I knew her before around 2014 or 15. But when she came, she was um, she was with Kairos and she was already connected to migrant workers in Western PEI. And um, for years has been supporting our work in spirit and in practice. She's been a um, presenter at several of our uh, large community forums. And I think that one of the things and she actually spoke to about this a few minutes ago, was just providing the context for the work we were doing, making the connection between what we're doing locally and what was driving people to leave their countries to come here. What were the, the circumstances, the conflicts, poverty? Um, the, um, the, that was, I think, one of the sort of gifts that, that Kairos and Connie has, have given us. Also um, emphasizing the importance of working in community and ensuring that um, communities are understanding the situations of migrant workers. Um, and now, of course, today we have the um, current, the uh, Empowering Migrant Workers projects that have been facilitated by, by Kairos. And those have really allowed us to address some of the critical issues that face migrant workers and the gaps um, illuminated by COVID. Because obviously the things that COVID that we're talking about during the pandemic um, are not new. Those are um, the, the issues that were highlighted had existed long before COVID happened. Um, the vulnerabilities that are caused by the temporary foreign worker program, the power that employers hold over workers, the lack of freedom and mobility, unhealthy and inadequate housing. Unfortunately, it took a crisis, a health crisis and workers' deaths to draw public attention to many of those issues. I think um, one of the, the things that David asked us to speak to is what sort of gives us hope. And I think in general, the fact that people are just more aware of the workers in their communities and of the challenges they face, that gives me some hope. I think also just um, the groups that are working across Canada in their own regions and collectively, that gives me hope. I think in PEI, we'll see temporary foreign worker legislation within the year, we hope. It may not have happened had the, the pandemic not demonstrated the need for such legislation. And I think, you know, our connections with Kairos, the Migrant Rights Network, those, th those connections have actually helped us to make this happen. But there's a lot, there's a lot more to do. You know, as um, David pointed out, some of the things that we've been asking for for many, many years still haven't happened. So to me, the most important um, issue is around permanent residency and pathways aren't working. We need permanent residency on arrival, access to healthcare, including provincial health care coverage for all, all workers, low, the improvement of labor standards um, and of complaint systems, which are not adequate. Um, I think advocating and organizing around those big issues involves creating opportunities for participation of migrant workers, empowering those workers, ensuring that their experiences inform the changes that we're working for. And we still need to be working as Kairos has been doing for so many years, welcoming people into our communities, whether it's faith communities or neighborhoods, making connections, understanding that migrant worker situations really do need to be understood in the community in order for change to happen. And that's, that's me. Thank you so much, Anne. Great to hear from you and from your perspective in PEI. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Roland Moreno from FCNB. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, let me thank uh, Kairos for uh, you know for uh, this opportunity to share uh, what our organization is and you know what is our aim as you know as a advocacy group for uh, 
temporary foreign workers. Uh, so FCNB is uh, basically, we are engaged in multicultural, social, civic, educational and charitable activities for the betterment of Filipino and Filipino Canadians in the province of New Brunswick. Our main objective is to preserve and promote the Filipino culture and ethnicity among its member, as well as to promote awareness of this heritage in the Canadian community. To encourage participation, cooperation, and coordination of multiple and civic related activities among various communities in New Brunswick and other countries. And lastly, to provide community assistance to Filipino nationals on their arrival in New Brunswick and help them adapt to a new lifestyle. So uh, I asked my, my wife, when do we start? Uh, uh, I can't recall how, how do we how we do we met Connie, but I as she told me that uh, I believe that uh, Connie and us uh, met in Toronto. Is that right, Connie? So uh, and uh, you know uh, from that point uh, we know that uh, she is very uh, uh, she has a heart for a passion to help the uh, migrant workers, and you know uh, we we got connected right away there, and every time. She comes. She came to she, she came to uh, Maritime. She always stopped over at, uh, at Fredericton, where our office is, and then we chat and we talk about you know the uh, the temporary foreign workers, the employers, their status, and what the government is doing to help them uh, during their stay in in uh, in New Brunswick. At that time, also we had uh, organized and become part of the uh, workshops, uh, meetings, uh, and you know we met. Uh, I introduced uh, Connie to uh, a church that uh, attended by a lot of uh, 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 Filipino uh, migrant workers in Sediac, New Brunswick. So, so through this project, uh, the uh, empowering temporary foreign workers during COVID nineteen, it really is uh, you know it gives uh, FCNB a capacity to you know to uh, to provide such thing as a services. This is always my dream to have that, uh, to have that uh, kind of services offered to them. In fact, I applied in, I think a, a few years ago, I applied uh, funding to the uh, provincial government. They liked the idea about helping the uh, migrant workers, but because uh, migrant workers are not funded, so we didn't get the, uh, we didn't get the funding. Uh, and thanks for, you know, for the partnership with the, uh, with uh, with Kairos that we are able to do such uh, such thing now. Uh, a little to tell you about the uh, Employment Standard Act in uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, actually, during that time that we are we are helping uh, temporary foreign, work, foreign workers, uh, it happens that uh, the uh, vice president of a company here in uh, in New Brunswick is uh, you know we always go to a uh, Sediac and Kapile. It's where the areas with a lot of migrant workers. It's the seafood migrant workers. And then we, we go there every week and we spend time with them. And then after our gathering, we document what, what we have discussed. And it happens also that, that that vice president is a friend of the premier of New Brunswick at that time, Premier Allward. And he whispered about you know what the condition of foreign workers in, in, in New Brunswick. So to, to tell you the short story of it, so it because of that conversation, because of that advocacy that we, we did, that the Employment Standard Act of, of New Brunswick has been uh, amended. That includes now the recognizing that you know that migrant workers are you know are are like an ordinary uh, workers that also have rights and privileges uh, under the uh, you know the uh, the Employment Standard Act. So there's we also have now. Uh, uh, the, the province of government now require the uh, uh, employers to register all the uh, temporary war foreign workers that go go, go to uh, go to New Brunswick. So, so it's a big help for us uh, because every time we go to employment standard act, if we, if employment standard. So if we have some uh, some issues or some complaints, we have a contact now in, inside inside the department. So I I've also been uh, you know uh, been. Uh, waiting and uh, you know monitoring the implementation of this uh, uh, new new changes to the employment standard act so that you know we can we can uh, assist the newcomers also and also the migrant workers as they come and enjoy their uh, their lifestyle in, in new brunswick uh, 
So let me talk about the go back to the to the project that we have with, with Kairos this year. So we were able to you know employ the three uh, three um, newcomers uh, because of this project, and uh, I I end up going into uh, different parts of New Brunswick to deliver. Uh, you know, right now we are on track of uh, delivering about a thousand uh, 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 welcome bags, uh, which you know we are really uh, passionate of doing it. Uh, even my staff, our staff are really uh, taking time to uh, to do that, and you know we're always uh, excited to uh, to meet other people because for them they see what we, what I see before that you know uh, it's always good to uh, it's it's a good feeling that you know you you help uh, migrant workers even just listening to them or giving them a, a simple uh, a simple gesture of uh, you know uh, smile and and it, it helps them. So our purpose in here that I'm trying to do is connect all the migrant workers. So if, if there's a problem with one, the other one might have a solution to it. So those are the things that uh, we, we learned from, from the project. You know, I thank, uh, thank you, Cody, for uh, uh, making us involved in, the, in this project. Uh, it's really uh, uh, give us opportunity to uh, provide assistance to uh, to the migrant workers. So from here, uh, what we're hoping to do is more collaboration. Uh, you know, uh, uh, count us uh, on on some of the uh, you know, if, if it pertains to migrant workers. Uh, we, actually, we're leading in the pro in the province. Other settlement organization, they're asking us, you know, how 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 do we get funding from it? I said, you know, uh, I have some friends in higher places. <laughs> no, I just say, you know, I you know because they are they're all a provincial uh, provincial funded funded one, and I told them that you know. Uh, this is this is the heart of uh, of, of CNB is to help uh, the migrant workers. So we're hoping that in a couple of years that uh, you know uh, that we would we would continue this advocacy uh, organization to uh, to you know to 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 assist the uh, migrant workers. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, good to hear from you and and your place in New Brunswick. I'm going to turn it over now to Essel to introduce yourself and um, what you have to share about the program. Thanks, Shannon. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this workshop. My name is Essel Panlaki, and I'm part of the Kairos um, Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Project team, working closely with Connie, David Mitos, and other colleagues at Kairos like Shannon, Alfredo, and many others. So today, um, I'll be talking about the Kairos and uh, the Employment uh, and Social Development Canada's Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers during COVID-19 Phase 2 project. So this project, which is being funded by the federal government through its Temporary Foreign Worker Program, aims to continue the successful uh, implementation of the Phase 1 project in supporting and assisting temporary foreign workers during the pandemic with a focus on the agricultural sector. So phase one of the project started uh, December 2017-2020 and, and ended on July 31st this year, uh, while phase two started in mid-August and then will end on December 15 uh, this year. With the successful implementation of the first and second uh, phase, we are expecting that the federal government will continue to support this work so we can continue to uh, provide support to agricultural workers who are considered as one of the vulnerable workers in Canada. So the funding that we received for phase two allowed us and our partners um, like uh, Roland and his group and many others um, is to uh, build on the success of the phase one project and to help uh, migrant workers during the pandemic by establishing a collaborative and coordinated approach with uh, 14 community grassroots and faith-based uh, and service provider agencies in providing support and services to temporary foreign workers. We continue to advance our work in collaboration with our partners, focusing our efforts in strengthening our partnerships with them and increasing their capacity, capacity so they can deliver more and better services for the migrant workers. So, um, in terms of our scope of work, our amazing and dedicated project partners provide incoming migrant workers uh, with welcome bags that include personal care equipment, language appropriate resources, and non-perishable food items. Um, other programs and services that we offer include information sessions, webinars, virtual workshops, and emergency assistance. Our partners are also um, visiting farms and public patients 
spaces for outreach and uh, service delivery for migrant workers. Also very important aspect of our work um, has been the airport uh, support services that we provide to uh, welcome, inform, and assist um, newly arrived migrant workers at Toronto Person International Airport by providing them informa information and quarantine measures, vaccinations, and additional supports. We also um, recently um, uh, started supporting workers leaving uh, Canada as the Canadian planting season ends. So the outcomes that we wanted to see um, are around increasing the number of migrant workers accessing emergency and non-emergency support services and increase their access to programs and services, and of course, increasing capacity of the workers to protect themselves and exercise their rights and increase the capacity of our partners to improve their work um, and also engage other stakeholders, including employers and local businesses, um, and most importantly, in terms of ensuring that the concerns and service gaps being faced by my migrant workers and partners are also being addressed. Next slide, please. Uh, David, uh, we are sharing with you this map to give you a better understanding uh, of uh, our, the geographical scope of our work. Um, our uh, efforts for phase two are focused in southern Ontario and the three uh, maritime provinces. Uh, we've also expanded our work to the Windsor Essex region. Next slide, please. And um, Three out of our 14 um, partners are from maritime provinces, uh, which include New Brunswick, uh, the Filipino-Canadian community of New Brunswick, which is being led by Roland, um, the Nova, uh, the No One is Illegal Halifax in Nova Scotia, and of course, the uh, Cooper Institute, uh, uh, Anne already mentioned about the great work, work that they've been doing with uh, migrant workers. And um, next slide, please. So for phase two, our uh, project, we are expected to serve 7,000 temporary foreign workers, including up to 1,000 migrant workers at Pearson Airport. We are pleased to share that on the second month of uh, our project implementation for second phase, we have exceeded all these targets and um, more especially many of our del deliverables. Now, we are so happy and proud to be working with our amazing partners like Roland and uh, the rest of uh, the 13 partners. We can't emphasize enough their, uh, enough, uh, their hard work and dedication and their important contribution in addressing the challenges and concerns of migrant workers to improve their access to services and programs and advancing their rights and dignity and recognizing their vital contribution in sustaining the Canadian food, um, chain and food security. Thank you. Thanks, Asol. Um, that was quick. I wasn't quite ready for you yet. <laughs> so we will have chance for questions later, but we have one more speaker uh, before we get to the Q&A. And so we are looking forward to hearing from Jazzer, who is also on Cairo's staff and has been a, uh, a migrant worker. Um, so Jazzer, welcome here. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Jazzer Montiliano. I am in Canada last year, like February 2020, just before the lockdown. So I'm just I'm a registered nurse in the Philippines, and I came here as a student. I'm studying a postgraduate course of advanced healthcare and management, and I'm a temporary worker as well. So yeah, just a brief background on what happened to myself last year. So when pandemic started and uh, when pandemic started, I responded to the need for the healthcare workers. There's a very big shortage of manpower in the long-term cares and nursing homes and retirement areas. So immediately, uh, it's because Canadian PSWs are not working anymore. So they have uh, families to take care of. They are afraid, they have fears that they will be transmitting to their own families. So the ones available are we, the migrant workers living alone in Canada. So I responded to the call. So in the same day, I was hired as a temporary emergency worker staff on a COVID stricken long-term care. So facing the same vulnerability with the other workers. So I work more than uh, the regular hours, like an average of 50 hours a week. 
yeah, it's more hours, but the worst time is when I guess when I when I'm infected with COVID. So thankfully it's a very mild physical symptoms, but what's more that time was the mental stress. Like just imagine yourself, you are living in a foreign country as a foreign worker with no family, no health insurance and and everything, like no connections. And yeah, I, I feel that time that I am the most vulnerable worker around that time. And, and the thing is like around April this year, when Canada is trying to end the lockdown, the regular full-time PSWs are coming back to work. And now since I, I was just a temporary worker, so I was given to less to no more hours to work. So yeah, I don't know what to do, but very timely, like the Kairos time, I, I want to call this the Kairos time because Kairos time means like God's appointed time. So I was hired, I was able to apply and work under Kairos ETFW support program and getting involved in welcoming the foreign workers and newcomers in Canada. So when I learned about the totality of this program, I was in big O like, oh, if I've only known of this program before, I wouldn't say that my life would be easier, but maybe it would be less difficult for me that time. So from my experience last year, and as one of the temporary, empowered temporary worker, I want to convey the spirit of empowerment to other migrant workers as well. So right now we are working on the Toronto Pearson Airport. One of the challenges we have encountered over there is that migrant workers, like not everyone, but most of them, they are so hesitant on giving their informations. It's innate to them that they are, have a fear of something of unknown or I don't know, but until I told them that I, um, I am a temporary worker too, and Dorian, my partner, is a successful immigrant, until then, they were more open about the real situation here in Canada. So because of that, we are receiving more calls from them. And yeah, we are, the advocacy is starting to work. So also, I would like to acknowledge the partnership and collaborations we have with the community partners because of them, like the delivery of services are more faster and efficient. And right now, what I'm feeling is that it's so heartwarming that to see that yesterday's problem is today's Thanksgiving to those people we have helped. And yeah, in my perspective, migrant justice is still a work in progress and empowering every migrant worker will make a big difference. So to end, uh, as, a fellow, as a fellow migrant worker, I wish to share this feeling of encouragement and empowerment to every migrant workers in Canada. That's it. Thanks so much, Jazzer. So now you have heard from these resource people. So a little bit uh, about Kairos and the work from, from Connie, from David, from Essel, and from, the, and from Jazzer a little bit about our work as well. Um, he is on the airport staff. And, um, and then from Anne and Roland, uh, who are um, in the Maritimes with that uh, on the ground work in that part of the country. So do you have questions for these folks? I would invite you to um, put them in the chat if you can or consider putting up your hand, but I know that David has prepared some questions. So why don't we start with one question from David for this panel of experts that we have with us. Uh, Anne spoke to this uh, in her wonderful presentation, um, but sort of opening it up to the uh, other panelists. Uh, the pandemic has fundamentally changed the landscape of migrant work in Canada. Uh, where do you see hope in the path forward? Um, where do you see um, motion forward? Either spring from the pandemic or um, due to the the awareness of uh, migrant, migrant workers that has come from uh, these shifts according to the pandemic. Um, so I'll, 
invite you to just unmute and jump in, or if we get a lot of folks, uh, we might even ask you to put your hands up. Panelists, where is your risk? What is your response? Connie, are you trying to get my attention? You have to <laughs> mute yourself. Well, I was having a hard time finding the reaction. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Roland and Jazzer, for, you know, for, for sharing. And as you were sharing, um, it reminded me when exactly we met and what we did and, you know, all the fun things that we, we've done. Uh, going to the different remote areas, both in, my, in, in PEI and also in New Brunswick reaching out and finding where the migrant workers are, particularly those in uh, the seafood, you know, processing and packaging uh, industry. So I remember, uh, before I respond to the question, <laughs> David, I remember my first trip to PEI. Uh, I was invited to speak in a forum in O'Leary. Uh, there was a big, big uh, snowstorm, and I was stranded there for three days because the airport was closed, the, um, um, the, the bridge was closed as well. And I was staying with Joe, uh, formerly the, the leader of the NDP and, and his family. So that was my first time and to, be, uh, to meet you and uh, be join the Cooper Institute um, workshop. And Roland in New Brunswick, that was in 2015. 15, when we organized uh, the Atlantic Forum on Migrant Workers. Um, we met there and not in Toronto. And after that, we've been to the different remote places as well in New Brunswick, Deer Island, Kapile, and, and reaching out to um, um, migrant workers in the province. So David, responding to the question, um, well, <sighs> Um, is there hope or what's, you know, ahead of us after the pandemic? But let me start first with what we did during the pandemic. Um, one, we shifted from our usual or the regular advocacy work and information and, and awareness, you know, work that we've been doing. Um, because of the need that migrant workers, are particularly those in the uh, in the farms and also the undocumented migrant workers face during the pandemic. The fact that they were excluded from the benefit packages that both the federal and the provincial government had put in place last year. We shifted a bit to provide direct support. So we, we also shifted in, you know, we're not able to do face-to-face -face or in-person meeting, but we, we, organized a series of webinars to get everyone connected, to have the situation, for example, of migrant workers in PEI and New Brunswick known to the other people in other areas. So there is that flow of information and support. Um, in, in, in December of 2020, we got funding from the federal government to provide direct support to uh, temporary foreign uh, workers, particularly in the agriculture sector. And this is, you know, a public uh, knowledge. Kairos got $2.1 million to do this work. And immediately we put in place a community coordinated approach where we went to the community level and searched out, you know, uh, partners, who are already doing the work at the community level. So the, the chart that ESSEL presented in terms of the, out, uh, the results, um, as ESSEL said, you know, we give thanks uh, to the work, the hard work of our community partners because they are the ones in direct communication and relationship with um, migrant workers in, in their respective uh, community. The pandemic has given us uh, some opportunities to be able to provide this direct support, but it also does not limit us from just doing that. We continue to do the advocacy. We continue to call for permanent residency and continue to call for policy change to improve and really respond to the situation of migrant workers. Um, at 
at all levels, so at, uh, in all sectors. So moving forward, when we get to the pandemic recovery period, and hopefully soon there will, you know, the pandemic ends, we want to do a more in-depth programming uh, in relation to res still responding to the needs and the gaps, but really increasing, you know, the advocacy work that we're doing. Thank you, Connie. Um, I have some thoughts, but I'm uh, welcoming any of the panelists if they want to hop in before I do. Just I saw both Anne and Roland took their mics off or unmuted. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, and it's probably repeating what I said earlier, but I'm just the, I mean, those things that the pandemic really highlighted in terms of. Um, the need for everybody to have access to, to um, comprehensive health care, uh, you know, and public health care insurance, health insurance. Um, I think that's um, it perversely an opportunity that the pandemic offers us that I think it strengthened our argument that we need that. And um, yeah, and then again, I, I agree with, with uh, Connie that permanent residency um, it, pathways are okay, but they're not enough. And in fact, they sometimes make workers more vulnerable in already very vulnerable situations um, because there's a lot more at stake and they're a lot, and they may be less likely to complain about abuse and, and those sorts of things. So um, yeah, I think that it's an opportunity. It, it's um, more people are aware of some of these, um, the problems with the temporary foreign worker program and the need for advocacy. And that um, we, you know, the whole idea that we can't go back to normal, we need a new normal, or, you know, I think that, that migrant labor is part of that whole discussion about how we move forward from the pandemic and how we ensure that, that um, nobody gets left behind. And Roland, did you want to jump in? Uh, well, I, I can say a, a couple of things. So I'm very hopeful uh, that you know the, the partnership with Kairos will, it, you know, will, will become stronger uh, because way back in 2012, uh, you know, become involved with uh, migrant workers and their, I, I have known what they've been uh, going through. So you know, where you know some 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 foreign workers are taking their passport. You know their their working permit, so that's why uh, they are not able to uh, to comply or you know to uh, to complain to whatever uh, hard work that they are doing. But now you know, I have not seen anybody like that. So there's the, our presence there. You know the work that uh, th that we all do makes the employers and you know the environment uh, better. And you know we we are, we are starting we're starting with the with the good ground and you know we 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 can continue you know uh, to provide direct services to them because we want to make sure that all those migrant workers that are about to come to Canada uh, will be in a better spot you know New Brunswick has uh, been looking for you know seven thousand five hundred newcomers and this year I think we only get two thousand so so there's a lot more migrant workers uh, that will that will be coming in. To Canada, and that's the answer to uh, to our you know problem with 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 uh, with with the population growth. So, is to bring in more uh, immigrants, and uh, so that we can help the economy, we can help everybody, we continue to continue the services, and you know our migrant workers is uh, is is our back of, of the economy. So, thank you. Thanks. So, David. Yes. So. Um sort of echoing what's been said, like the, the pandemic was a crisis that brought much needed attention to the issue. Certainly, I would prefer no pandemic over having one, um, but the amount of change uh, that has come from having a specifically health-related crisis um, to bring um, necessary care and attention to the issue of uh, migrant work um, I think, and even before I was involved with Kairos or the project, um, there were more news stories about um, 
the agricultural job market and the, the necessity of migrant work uh, in Canada. So I think um, the sort of baseline public consciousness of, um, of these programs um, being, uh, yeah, the awareness level has certainly risen. Um, and that the government of Canada is supporting um, these uh, currently emergency measures, but uh, like with such a strong network of support, um, there's, uh, I see a lot of justification for continuing this program uh, forward beyond um, because that community coordinated approach includes those 14 partners, but those 14 partners are also partnering with further organizations. So the, like the, the mass of uh, people who are interested and engaged with this topic um, has increased uh, through this program, but also with that general awareness raising that's been going on. So the hope I see in this is that um, we have more engaged people um, uh, doing what they can to support uh, migrant workers um, and putting pressure on the government to uh, to change policy for for the better. I think there's a lot of really great work going on in Kairos, but I think overall, I think the issue is um, is coming to the fore um, because things have needed to change since 2006. <laughs> and we're seeing some of those things happening, so. Yes, thanks to David for that great question about hope. And there have been a few questions coming in in the chat box and I, I maybe jumped in where I didn't need to. Um, uh, Peter was asking about the future of funding. Assel made a very quick reference to it um, are we in a position to expand on that at this point in terms of longer term funding? I know it's our hope. I wonder if anyone else is prepared to say more. If not, we have other questions. Connie, are you jumping in or are you saying, let's hear what yes. else? <laughs> yeah, no, just very briefly uh, to respond to Father uh, Peter's question. I would say we are in a very good position to negotiate for a more longer term multi-year uh, project programming, just because we're able to show to the government and to the public as well that you know the community coordinated approach is, is successful in terms of really being able to one. Uh, and, and, and I think this also uh, connects to uh, the other question in the box in terms of the chat box in terms of lessons learned. It is very important, the, the, the very important aspect of this is partnership, collaboration, working with organizations and grassroots communities that are already doing the work, recognizing their work and leveraging uh, on those you know, activities. So that's one, um, I guess, important principle. The other one is respect that you are working together in this project in providing support and services as equals. Um, we, you know, we, 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 we support each other. We try to, uh, to reach, you know, the objectives, but in a very mutual and respectful way. Um, we are obligated in some ways to the funders, but that is, you know, I guess, the very important uh, aspect is relationship. Relationship, partnership, and respect, and, and mutuality. Um, so having said that, and also picking on what David uh, has mentioned, we have 14 organizations across four provinces, Ontario, New Brunswick, PEI, and, and Nova Scotia. And these 14 organizations are in network and in collaboration with other grassroots organizations or community groups as well. So in my report, uh, the 14 organizations are actually bringing with them about 150 to 200 smaller community grassroots organizations involved and engaged in this project. So we are, you know, so having said that, 
I reiterate, we are in a very good position to, you know, to negotiate for a long-term uh, project. Thanks, Connie. And um, maybe someone else would like to jump in on what's the, the uh, word in reality here about hospitals. Do hospitals deny healthcare to uninsured people in Canada? Do you folks who are assisting migrant workers on the ground have an, a, a definitive answer to that? Well, um, I'm not sure about denying, but I know that, you know, if, if migrant workers aren't eligible for health care, for provincial health care coverage, their employers are required to provide private health insurance. So migrant workers will have coverage um, not so undocumented people, likely, um, but um, the private the private um, insurance might not cover um, everything. It's it's more sort of like tourist <laughs> type health insurance. So um, so that's one issue. But and when you do arrive at the hospital, I believe um, that you have to pay a fee. Um, you're asked for a fee at the hospital if you don't have coverage. So um, I'm not sure about turning somebody away if they're in an emergency. I don't know that that would happen, but I do know that you would be expected to pay. Thanks. Um, I don't know. Other people might have better, better or more. more other experience you, so you want to throw in? Uh, in our in New Brunswick, uh, basically, uh, that's the same uh, uh, experience we have. Uh, we have a couple of uh, temporary for workers that uh, needing uh, 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 an advanced uh, health care. And, you know, the only thing is they have to pay because it's not covered by the uh, insurance that they have with the employer. Like it's just a travel insurance that has a limited uh, uh, coverage. So through Kairos, uh, we're still uh, doing an assessment. If we could help them, assist them uh, for, for that uh, 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 for that uh, need. So, thank you. And that's not the only issue with healthcare. You know, health access to healthcare language is a huge one, where translation services in this province, anyway, maybe by telephone in the hospital, they're not offered at all in any other healthcare provider setting so um so that and and also just private insurance you know you do often workers are asked to pay up front and um, be reimbursed afterwards and that's not a really fair or workable system mm -hmm. um father peter are you jump in i was just yeah i was just going to add uh, one of the unique problems for the farm workers is the uh, accessibility. Uh, as far as I know, I haven't heard too many cases of denial because of insurance, but one of the issues that arises is uh, getting to the clinics and hospitals. And sometimes employers are responsive and, and sometimes they're not so responsive. I know we've had to escort sometimes and even service translators. So there are some of those other issues as well around healthcare. Mm -hmm. Anyone else I want to add to the healthcare conversation before we uh, take another angle at the lessons and learned? Um, Shannon, yes. I just want to add uh, that, yes, uh, as Anne said, um, we don't know about being turned, you know, turned down or, you know, at the hospital level. But we, 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 we know that workers are going to be billed or they're going to be asked to pay before the service provided. But also to, to include you know, the situation and the vulnerabilities of uh, undocumented workers. Like they are you know, not able to, they were, they, they were not and are still not able to access healthcare because they don't have the credentials and, and, and the status, you know, to present uh, when they approach the hospital or the clinic and so forth. So they are sick and they are suffering in the shadows because they are afraid to come out and access support and services 
because of fear of being reported and deported. So just, you know, to put that out there. And I also wanted to invite other, uh, we have partners who are with us uh, uh, at this workshop and, you know, you, you're free to jump in if you have uh, information to share with regards to a specific question that is being asked. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to add too that, um, Fundamentally, this is about us treating migrant workers as, as um, inferior, as it not um, deserving of the same, the same services and benefits as everybody else. And so it's just, it's just one example of how we practice um, inequality in this country. And, you know, and healthcare is one of the things that Canadians always brag about. Everybody, everybody apparently has access to to um, no cost, uh, air, you know, to, to full coverage of, by the public health care system. And that's patently not true. And it's just one way that we, um, we, we treat migrant workers unequally. And you uh, have mentioned undocumented workers. I wonder if someone would uh, jump in and just give a couple of quick reasons or why someone might be undocumented. Asshole, do you want to take a crack at that before you, or you go ahead with what you were going yes. to say? Yes, I'm supposed to talk about the um, access to healthcare, but I can also share my experience. Uh, I can also answer your question why people become documented, especially in the past few years, there's been so many changes regarding policies, not only to agricultural workers, but to the whole uh, spectrum or program, a temporary foreign worker program. And sometimes the policies are good uh, the way you look at it, but when you dig deeper, there are very um, discriminate, discriminatory at some point, and they're causing um, the, uh, the, the migrant workers to suffer more, right, considering they're already vulnerable. So especially the uh, program around um, the migrant caregiver program, uh, many of the people who were um, like ex excluded from the pathways that were presented uh, in the last few years um, already don't have status and now struggling with accessing many of the services and just uh, sharing some of our experience um, in helping them provide the uh, accessing health services. Um, the hospitals usually don't turn around, uh, turn them away, especially here in Ontario, but they've been asked to uh, pay, uh, uh, sign a promissory note. And uh, in some cases, uh, migrant uh, caregivers and other migrant workers ending up paying thousands of dollars to pay back uh, the hospitals for accessing services. Thanks, Asso, for adding your, your wisdom to that. So just to be clear, um, would it be true to say that the vast majority of undocumented workers you've, uh, you've met um, came into the country through some legal means and something happened here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is something that I didn't realize until I was working at Kairos and started hearing more. So that gives a, a very different perspective to the term. Shannon, before we leave that topic, because <laughs> I want to add something. This is very important. When when the 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 conservative government put in place the four years in, four years out rule, this caused a lot of migrant workers to become undocumented. What the four years in and four years out rule was, you know, workers who are admitted to Canada as temporary foreign workers can only stay for four years. And after four years, they had to leave and then wait again for another four years before they can come back as a temporary worker. As Essel had mentioned uh, earlier, workers, majority of the workers who, who, who come or came to Canada paid exorbitant um, recruiters fee, placement fees, and other uh, government exactions. For them, to leave, you know, after in after four years, the, they're not even, or they haven't even paid for what they owe in paying for the recruitment fees and other um, other expenses in coming to Canada. So the workers' option is to go undocumented and not leave. So that policy alone had created so many. Uh, 
migrant workers who came to Canada legally and became undocumented in the process. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing about that, Connie. Carolyn, did you have another question? I saw you put your hand up and then maybe you didn't. No, I didn't. I just had the question about uh, what's happening in the Western provinces. Well, that is that is a question I think that some of our staff or our partners could address. We are in the Eastern provinces. What's happening in the West? Come on, folks, the rest of you know as much as I do. Kairos is one of, what is it, six or seven um, um, organizations that the federal government is funding, and some of those other organizations are receiving similar funding while having different um, organizational approaches to the um, supporting migrant workers uh, at this point. So Kairos is also trying to spread a, um, a way of working across the country as Connie and others are invited to sit at that federal table and, and at the federal government level, the collaboration is starting to happen. So we hope that that will happen in other provinces too. David, do you wanna add? And the, um, the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Program is modeled in part uh, after a program in BC that was doing that um, networking between uh, organizations, I would say in a different way. I, <laughs> I find uh, this program in sort of the comparison is doing more of that sort of like further networking down the line. Um, but there are, um, there are networks supporting uh, the Western provinces as well. Um, and we hope to continue collaborating with them uh, to uh, ensure that those supports are available across Canada. Um, the airport services, um, we have um, some connection um, to pass on to workers that are carrying on um, from Toronto to uh, the Western provinces as well. Uh, and we're hoping to sort of strengthen that so that um, the support services from Kairos at the airport uh, can um, follow a sort of stronger chain of supports through the different airports uh, to the West. Um, to be very specific, um, uh, to our friends who are with us uh, at the workshop today and wherever a location you are. Uh, so for example, for the West Coast, uh, there is Mosaic and AMSA, the, the umbrella organization of, uh, in, 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 in BC that's providing that support to migrant workers and migrant workers support organizations. In the prairies, this is covering Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. There is CCIS. This is the Catholic um, Settlement and Immigration uh, Society. Sorry, CCIS. So, yes, Catholic, uh, so Calgary Catholic Immigration uh, Society. So that uh, organization is similar to Kairos in terms of uh, getting funding from the federal government to support uh, migrant workers and migrant workers support organizations in, in the three provinces in the prairies. And there's one in Quebec and Kairos uh, being, you know, covering four uh, provinces, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI. Yes. Thanks, uh, colleagues. And thanks, Carolyn, for your question. Um, folks, if you want to put another question in the chat, you'd be welcome to. We are, we probably have about seven more minutes for the Q&A. And um, I have a question just to go back to the lessons learned. And Connie, you, you addressed this and, and Lee summarized it nicely for us in the chat, relationship, partnership, respect, and mutuality. And I wondered if you might um, expand on this idea about does funding um, curtail our advocacy with the government or is it in fact helpful that you are now sitting at 
government tables. Can you expand on that? Is that something we can learn and spread to other uh, aspects of our work? Um, thank you, Shannon, for that question. Um, Actually, in the beginning, you know, when we when we received the funding, my first fear was becoming isolated from the advocacy network and groups, um, because there is that assumption that when you receive funding from the government, there is uh, there is some strings attached to it, including you know doing advocacy. Fortunately, we're not affected by that. We we're still able to do our advocacy and at the same time providing direct support uh, to migrant workers. Um, we, we continue to call for the status for all permanent residency upon arrival. We speak to members of parliament, senate about uh, our position with regards to status. But at the same time, we cannot deny the fact that, you know, while we're, we're working uh, on that bigger call or there, there are emergencies and immediate needs and, 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 and gaps that, uh, that have to be responded. So we were able to combine both. And we, that fear of being isolated didn't happen. And I want us to be able to continue that, that we're not giving up our advocacy positions, our advocacy, advocacy call, just and, and just, you know, keep keep our work in limited to providing direct uh, support and services. In, in fact, this is helping a lot too in terms of empowering the workers, in, 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 in helping the workers uh, report allegations of abuse and using government government tip line and government resources. We're able to provide support and accompaniment for them to be able to do that. And we're able to provide emergency assistance. For example, when a, when a worker submitted a, a report using the tip line and they have to leave the, 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 the place of work or where he's working and is being you know, accommodated, we're able to provide emergency housing. But we have to be, uh, we have to have uh, a, a plan uh, in order to make sure that when we empower the worker to, to exercise their rights, that we are able to provide them the information and, su and support they needed to be able to do that. And being uh, and sitting in different government tables with regards to uh, the work, uh, the support, we're able to advocate again, you know, and, and show to them cases that we encounter on our day-to-day -day implementation of this project. So it is very helpful. Yeah. I wonder if you might even add about some smaller examples, the advocacy for um, good procedure. I'm thinking of things like when the the COVID health line check-in. If you're in quarantine, you need to check in every day. And at the beginning of this, there was no Spanish translation. And so one of our partners was uh, calling the workers every day and doing three-way calls just so that they could help tell the health department I'm doing fine today. Um, and, and that was changed with some advocacy, was it not? Uh, yes. <laughs> First of all, I just I, I want to mention that you know most of our community partners and our staff at the airport is very diverse, are very diverse, and speak different languages to be able to provide support and some level of comfort, you know, to the workers who are coming in. So at the airport, for example, we have Chasser Tagalog speaking. Uh, um, staff, Spanish speaking, and also Patois, the Caribbean dialect. Similarly, many of our community uh, partners are provide those languages to be able to really support uh, the workers. We've also um, shown, or we've also advocated for the government to ensure that information handouts or information materials that they are producing are translated into different languages so that workers would have access to it. 
we've also advocated that visuals and audio resource information are produced because many of the information that they've produced so far are heavily text uh, loaded and workers would not have time to read all the all what's in the document so there's there's movement in making sure that the the information are are easily accessible to the workers and we are doing that too as part of the project we are translating documents in different languages we're developing infographics and videos using government sourced information thanks connie david yeah, I'm just going to pop it quick before <laughs> we shift over. But um, I think to um, like I've m the focus of my work is uh, on communications media and webinars are a big part of that. Um, and um, from our last webinar on the sixth, uh, I think it's important that uh, like while engaging with the government um in the running of this project we've also been able to forge connections with people to uh, be part of public sessions that allow uh workers themselves as well as people working with uh directly with workers to be able to speak to their experience um with uh the tip line for example um like being able to give them not just <laughs> the ideal of how these uh, programs operate, but how they are being experienced by people working directly with migrant workers, I think is an important um, avenue for pushing for the improvement of these programs. Um, I think having those real experiences and having challenging questions, yes, um, uh, brought in those forums um, and allowing space for uh, an understanding of how these programs are supposed to operate, I think, is a sort of useful um, bridge between the, our community partners that we're working with and Service Canada, who is uh, funding the program. I think those uh, those bridges are really important in how we're um, continuing that advocacy, even while doing a program funded by the government. Mm -hmm. David, I was thinking the word bridge just before you uh, said it. And I really think that recent uh, webinar was such a good example of Kairos invites the community partners and Kairos invites the government and everybody shows up and they're in the same room. <laughs> Here's the bridge. Um, so thank you to everyone who has put forward some questions and to all our panelists for um, participating and responding to these questions. Know that these partners are uh, available to, uh, to be in dialogue with you all. You can find uh, contact information for all the partners on the website. Um, I'll go find that link. Well, Connie is going to um, share a few concluding thoughts with us. Thank you very much, Shannon, and thank you to Anne, to Roland, to Jasser, to Essel, and to David for sharing with us at this, you know, uh, this workshop. Um, and to all who joined this workshop, your, your questions, uh, your support and passion for this break is also very important. We won't be able to get to this point without your support. I think that is very, very important to recognize. As, as you know, as we practice our faith, we, we believe that we are all created equal. That as Anne said, not because you're a migrant worker, not because you cross the border, you are less human when you get to the other side. We all have the same rights. We all have the same dignity. And they should not be taken by, from us just because we have to flee militarization. We have to flee the impacts of climate change. We have to flee poverty in the countries where we are from or these migrant workers are from. So we've, we've gone quite a bit a long way in terms of our information sharing, in terms of our organizing, in terms of 
our awareness raising. We've developed some tools uh, and you can see it at the Kairos uh, webpage, the Migrant Justice webpage, to help communities, to help, uh, to help faith groups on how to establish relationship with migrant workers, to listen uh, to their situation and be able to provide accompaniment and witness. We'll continue to do this work. The 20, 20 years of Kairos, this 20th uh, anniversary is just the beginning of more years, you know, to dedicate and, and provide service to our, our, I wouldn't say our migrant workers, our fellow men who are in different situations than us, but we, all, we are all the same in the eyes of God, in the eyes of supposedly law and, and, and so forth. And we will continue to reach out to you uh, for support, for accompaniment, to join and participate in the campaigns that we're going to be launching, to push for what we're calling for, permanent status and status for all, permanent residents. Canada should bring in more permanent residents people with permanent status to meet labor demands and not migrant workers who are disposable and can, you know, can be easily sent back to countries where they are from. This is, this is our hope. This is our dream in the years to come that Canada, that Canada gets to a point where the temporary foreign workers program is eliminated and that everyone is welcome here as permanent residents. So again, we thank you and we hope for your continued support and, and accompaniment as we continue to our work for migrant justice. Thank you.